Forbes loves her, naming her one of 30 inspirational women and their 30 under 30 list. Skip this part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, in Starstruck, a memoir of astrophysics and bending, finding light in the dark, which we're here tonight to celebrate. Serafina shares how she boldly carved out a place in the field of astrophysics, grounding herself in a lifelong love of the stars to face life's inevitable challenges and embrace the unknown. I love what Mary Roach, the author of Buzz, had to say about Starstruck, and I can't imagine saying it better myself. So, thanks to Nance's genius for clear explanations, I understand how, with pressure and time, suns are created. How fitting, then, to be learning of Nance's own journey, the dark pressures of childhood, the molten hot passion for science, and the way these forces combine to make a brilliant light that is Seraphine and Nance. A star is born. <laughs> and without any further ado, here's Seraphine and Sasha. Can you hear us? We've been directed to speak into the microphone, so we're going to try to do that. You can just yell out that when we're not doing it. Um, I'm so happy to be with you this evening. Seraphine and I feel like we know each other, but this is actually the first time we've ever met, but not the first time I've had the pleasure of interviewing her about her excellent, beautiful, beautiful book. Um, so, hi, welcome to hi. <laughs> It feels like a dream, just so everybody knows. Yes, this is ostensibly my book event, but truly, Sasha Sagan is one of the most incredible writers and people that I know and I have looked up to for years, and it's a dream to be here with you. So thanks for being here. She wins. <laughs> thanks. Um, that's very kind, but enough about me. Um, so the last time we spoke, um, your book hadn't come out yet, and I'm really curious I have had the pleasure of reading it um, ahead of time, but it, I, I'm so curious about the response you've gotten, what surprised you the most, and what, you know, sometimes when you write, you know, a couple hundred pages, there's stuff that you don't necessarily think is going to stand out the way it does. I'm curious, what has stood out to your audience, to your readers, uh, that surprised you? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, not one that I've gotten yet, so I'm excited to, to think about it. I think one of the more challenging parts about writing a book, and I'm curious if you have the same experience, is you write this thing, you spend years on it, and then all of a sudden, it's out of your hands, you like birth this book baby, and then it's gone. And there's this like, sort of like, you have to release any sort of control or I don't know, any sort of like attachment yes. to this thing. And suddenly it's out in the world, people are going to respond to it and resonate with it, hopefully, or they might not. Right. And I think it's, I've had to learn to be okay with both and just sort of like be in the present moment of like this precious time that is probably, right, like this is a transient moment that's not gonna happen again. and. Like that's a challenge and it's also wonderful and beautiful. Um, I think the things that have stuck out to me the most, ugh, I have thought a lot about what this book means. This isn't really a book that like, you know, you can say it's about science or it's about mental health. It's such a multi-dimensional book. And I think I hit on a lot of things because to me, that's what life is about. It's a lot of different things. And it's been really interesting to see what resonates with, with different types yeah. of readers and different different people and hearing people's stories of saying, you know, like, I really loved this science section because it made me think deeply about like my path as a scientist, which is so beautiful. And then on the other hand, people resonating with the anxiety portion. Yes. Which I definitely want to talk about. Yeah, oh, which I'll yeah, talk about all day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think uh, it's been wonderful feeling like I can put this in the world and people can hold its fullness and try to like, I don't know, experience the wholeness in, in you know, everyone's own unique way, yeah. which is beautiful. Yeah. I'm so curious. So the, the chapters begin with these really grand, really majestic descriptions of scientific phenomena and astronomical events 
and inspired they, by Carl's account. <laughs> <laughs> I felt there was, I, it felt familiar and wonderful in, in some unspoken way. But it, what so impressed me um, is that the, the, thematically they related to the very earthly, personal events in the chapter. And I'm curious how, as a writer, you connected these things that are, you know, seemingly the, you know, the largest scale and the smallest scale of the internal, personal heartbreak and joys of life with these, you know, enormous, sometimes very hard to, to wrap our minds around um, events in the, in the universe. How did you draw those connect, connections and parallels as you're going along? Did you do them at the end? Mm -hmm. What was the process? So I think I was always interested in weaving together science and life. Mm. Um, you know, I'd read books like Lab Girl, which do that so beautifully. Um, and I was especially interested in what that meant from this perspective of science is not separate from human. Yes. Um, and it felt important to emphasize that on a literary level as well as you know, on this sort of like thematic level. Yeah. And I like to think about, you know, from this foundational perspective of we are star stuff. We are literally the stuff of the universe. And so it's almost impossible to write about the human condition or to write about our relationship with one another or how we evolve through our lives without also acknowledging the like very real physical ties yeah. that we have with the universe. And then it was a matter of exploring how best to, you know, make those parallel yeah. with the different chapters of my life. And I thought, you know, it was an interesting task to sort of trace the evolution of the universe in parallel with the evolution of my own life. Yeah. And I, I hope that it, you know, it's it works in some ways. Oh, I for think. sure. It's <laughs> um, yeah. But you know, I was. It was a really fun problem. It's a different type of like science problem to think about, you know, what is it about binary star systems that actually relate to family dynamics? Mm. Or what is it about black holes that make you feel hopeless? And like bringing the emotion into the science yes. um, while also talking about the science in a very real, you know, like, I don't know, authentic way. And I think it works so well to do this we have you know these divisions between subjects you go to school you go one teacher they talk about one thing the bell rings you go somewhere else they talk about something else and we have this idea never the twain shall meet and i think that that's so uh devastating to our like really you know all the awe and wonder that we can glean from experiencing the universe and our place in it and trying to like find these parallels and I think it really does a lot to sort of you know the idea that like stories and feelings are this over mm -hmm. here and then there's hard cold facts and we cannot they cannot hang out together and I think that there's really something really effective and really hopeful about the way that you you sort of break down that wall thank you I mean I just I'll say one more thing about that um I think to your point, scientists are often asked to, uh, you know, separate themselves from the science. And, uh, you know, of course, when you're conducting a research study or when you're trying to do something that's like very methodical and analytical, that makes sense. But I think when we're talking about science in this broader perspective of its impact on humans and how humans have a relationship with science yeah. and like science education and communication, it's so important to, to, in my opinion, to talk about why it matters. Yeah. And that's the emotion, that's the, that's the human part of it all, and that's what I was really interested in investigating. Yeah, no, and it comes across so well. Um, and in the realm of emotion, as, as um, foreshadowed, okay, um, like this idea of when you write so, honestly and so beautifully about this experience that I'm sure everyone in this room has had, sometimes, all the time, um, anxiety. <laughs> like, and this idea that it's like, you know, this sort of forbidden thing, but you don't, or, or, not, or maybe not forbidden, but it's this thing that's, you know, kind of like uh, very negatively <laughs> um, presented, and you sort of write about it in this loving way that it's like it's not intrinsically 
terrible and it's kind of useful sometimes and sort of navigating it in this way that's not like it must be eradicated mm -hmm. from our existence. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I was actually just talking to one of my best friends about this earlier today. I, I mean, my relationship with anxiety has evolved. I used to think that anxiety was, you know, my worst characteristic and something that was sort of like, I don't know, my kryptonite, mm. I guess. And I think through many years of therapy, I've learned that anxiety is not good or bad. It just is. Mm. Um, and that might sound trite, but I do think there's, I do think it's true. My anxiety has in many ways like fueled a lot of my desire to achieve and to, yeah. you know, try new things and pursue my dreams and, you know, I don't know, put myself out there in the world in ways that I might not otherwise. Yeah. While on the other hand, you know, of course there are very negative parts about my anxiety in that I have panic attacks. I feel like physically very yeah. bad. I create these internal narratives that make me question my worth and my existence. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm learning, I'm still learning to hold all of that and I think be in relationship with it rather than sort of impose it to or you know put it in a corner where I'm never going to touch it and right. be afraid of it because right. I think only by being in relationship with it can I um, I don't know move forward it's not even about overcoming it's just sort of like moving forward in tandem with it I almost feel like the way you're talking about it is like harnessing it too sometimes totally for useful totally yeah I mean I think anxiety for me often feels like a lack of control and a fear of that mm -hmm. lack of control. Yeah. And there are ways in which I can be in relationship with my anxiety. So for example, you know, me choosing to get a preventative double mastectomy, like that was fueled by science, but also by anxiety. And it was also one of the best decisions that I could have made for myself and for my health, and it ultimately was very empowering. Yeah. So there's a way to be in a relationship with anxiety that is actually, um, like, I don't know, is is sort of the best thing for yourself, yeah. right? Well, because obviously we evolved, and it's quite useful in certain circumstances mm -hmm. um, to be anxious, and it's just that we still have to nap, you know, it's like the thing about, like, you can't believe everything you think, you know what I mean? Like, just because you're right. anxious, like, but in this way you're describing where you use the science as this sort of external litmus test mm -hmm. for is this just me or no <laughs> you know yeah and i think we all have our litmus tests yeah. for me it's science yeah and for you know other people it's something else and i think having you know something that's outside of your brain yeah. that can check you yeah is yeah. so helpful and i you know i'm not a mental health professional obviously but i think been through so many years of therapy and a lot of that and therapy after a certain number of years you get to yeah I'm like an honorary yes, yes. 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 Like, professional yes. therapy yes. student um <laughs> but yeah I think what I've learned is is you know and we talked about this on your podcast where we are not our emotions but our emotions and our body is telling us something yeah. useful and yeah. important and I think that anxiety is the same thing right it's it's a bodily indicator that I want to listen yeah. to and might have really important information about where I am or what I'm doing. And it's learning to like read those thoughts and then have the agency to decide what to do with them. Yeah. yeah. And I will say, I mean, yes, there's true. There are so many different external litmus tests people have to sign. It's a really good one. It's yes, like good, it, it is. is. It's, like say, it's a good system. So one of the things, one of the, you know, things that I thought was so great in this book as well is the way that you talk about you totally disabuse me of this idea that you have to be like a natural mathematician <laughs> to be yeah. or at least to be not you know to have like a you know basically basically positive relationship with math to go into astrophysics and it's just like did you have that notion before reading the book well i i i feel like there is like a lot of sort of like math phobia in the culture and people are like oh i don't do that like it's like oh it's like it's like almost like it's a like oh i can't do that because of my religious belief it's like oh i don't do math and i get right. and i really like i'm not a mathematician i'm not a scientist i'm you know a writer but i love arithmetic and i love math and i really like i like the idea of when you do something and it's like there is a right answer even though most of the things that i think about there's 
there's a lot of ambiguity. Totally. But I like, like, oh, there's definitely, I mean, I'll just tell you guys at a certain point in that, like, right. it gets a little gray. Um, right. So I do like that. But I did sort of think that, that that if you were sort of, like, had the idea about yourself that you were bad at math, it would be just difficult to go into astrophysics. Yeah, I thought that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> I, I think that, unfortunately, um, primarily, marginalized groups, so women and people of color, are sort of explicitly and implicitly told over and over mm. throughout their lives mm. that they are not cut out for specific things. One of those, in my experience, has been STEM. And, you know, those uh, messages compound and ultimately push people out yeah. of STEM. Yeah. And so, and people who could be really brilliant. Absolutely. And I and I think another sort of insidious aspect of this, sorry, um, really emphatic about this, um, a sort of insidious like result of this is that people develop these internal narratives, yeah. I am one of them, of I am not cut out for math yeah. and I never will be. Right. And I don't belong here. And what is the trick? I mean, you write about it, but talk yeah, about it a little more. I mean, I think part of it, to be completely honest with you, is like a little bit of masochism where I was like, I just got to keep going. Um, no, but I think it was, it was, it, there's two parts of it. One is I like desperately, deeply loved the night sky. And I, you know, from the age of four or five, I was like, it was as though I was in relationship with yeah. the night sky. Like, that's how deep that love was. And I think, you know, I'm so glad you started this conversation out with a conversation around mental health because those are, to me, intrinsically, like, related. I felt anxious from a very young age. I felt overwhelmed. I sought out the night sky as a reprieve, mm. as a way to contextualize, you know, these big feelings that I had. Yeah. And in that way, it was by necessity. Like, I had to hold on to that. It's almost like you fell in love with someone who spoke a different language and you had to learn their language in order to I love that. Them. Oh, and totally. Math is the language. Exactly. And I was terrible at it. I was so bad it at it. And that all came to rom com. Yeah, it turns out my book is actually a romantic yeah. comedy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was so you know, bad at math for all of these reasons that I listed and also because like it just, I, I didn't have a natural proclivity to it. Yeah. And I, I don't actually think that having a natural proclivity towards math is all that common. I think that that is a thing mm -hmm. that we tell ourselves about people who are good at math when in reality, you know, it, 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 people have a relationship with math and science in varying ways in different languages. Yeah and are exposed to it in different times in their lives. And so you end up with people who are in college classrooms who sound like they've been born to do physics, yes. when in reality, they just have a completely different background than you. Well, and it's the flip side of what you're saying about everybody who gets dissuaded from doing STEM. It's like, well, and if you're told when you're a little kid, oh, yep. you, you are just so gifted at this. You're so yes. good at this. Wow, you know, you lost the yes. table ahead of everyone else. It becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly. Absolutely. We're such good friends, we finish each other's yeah. sentences. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yes, and so like, I just, okay, so also in this vein of, of identity and the way we see ourselves, um, you also write about your relationship with your Egyptian American identity. And I'm curious oh, how as time is going on since you wrote it, as you're getting to another stage in your life in a few weeks, a month or two, like how has like the identity, like as you, I mean this is so good with my area, just as you go forward into a <laughs> ritual that um, is yeah. a very um, beloved and celebratory ritual, like how are these parts of your um, identity, like how, how have they changed, what do you think yeah. in this new phase? Um, Great question, and for those who don't know, the ritual she's talking about is I'm getting married. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I'm so glad you asked this because this book, I, I write about this in the acknowledgement section, but it really was a form of self-discovery, mm -hmm. right? It was a form of catharsis, of processing, and also, you know, finding meaning and really trying to delve deep into like, 
what are, not just why am I the way that I am, but also like what are the broadly universal mm -hmm. aspects of my life that, you know, other people might experience yeah. too, right? What are these yeah. systems or institutions or like broader things that, that create one person's life and another person's yeah. life? And as part of that, I thought deeply about, you know, my identity and I think I've always struggled because I've always felt like I didn't belong in, you know, sort of one identity or another. Being Egyptian American, yeah. I straddled two worlds and I think, you know, I'm white passing. I I grew up in, you know, Texas, but I also like had this sort of Middle Eastern group of friends that I hung out with and so it was it's it's always felt like I didn't quite know what I can claim, mm -hmm. how I can be in relationship with it. Um, and this book was a really wonderful way for me to get in touch with that part of myself yeah. and connect with it more deeply. And I think like I write about these instances in the book where I felt so ashamed of my yeah. heritage yeah. and like I had straightened my hair now, but like I wear my hair curly a lot more now yeah. than I used to as a yeah. kid. There were years where, you know, my classmates thought I had straight hair because I was so embarrassed of my like Egyptian curls. And that's a minor example, but you know, my mom stopped speaking Arabic to me in public because, you know, I was, yes, I was ridiculed and yes, there were racist slurs, but I also sort of internalized racism yeah. and felt ashamed of having that as part of my identity. And so much of my, like, the last couple of years has been unlearning that. Yeah. And I think, like, falling back in love with that part of who I am and that part of my culture and, and you know, I think it's something that I'm a little bit, I, there's a fear in there because I, I want to, I don't know what I don't know. And I want to make sure that I'm, like, I don't know, honoring all aspects of mm -hmm. it. But it's so important to me, and it's something that I'm really grateful that this book has has like brought to the surface in my life. Yeah. Well, it's like there's something about writing. I mean, it's a memoir. It's something about something about sorry, microphone. Something about writing a memoir that does put like things in stark relief that maybe you never until you have to write it down in words. It's just this amorphous sort of totally. feeling, and it's so. It's, I mean, I really think you know it's as much often for the person writing than the person reading. Yeah, I I am so glad you said that because I think sometimes I feel a little bit fake when people ask me, you know, like, who is this book for? And I'm like, yeah, I want it to connect with readers, but I also, like, truly yeah. wrote it in part for myself. Like, there's, oh. like, a deep and personal investment in these pages and then, like, pouring your soul into something. I just, this is maybe, I'm going to say something maybe controversial. We'll say, I'll say it and then we'll see if I agree with that. But like, I kind of think that every, like, every time anyone makes any art of any kind, it's really for themselves. Yeah. And like, and if anyone else likes it, well, that's a lucky break. Totally. But if not, that's not really the, you know? Yeah, I mean, the more artists I speak to, the more yeah. I hear that answer. I feel like it's like this, like, burning, like, almost discomfort of this thing of, like, get out into the world. And I'm talking about a book, baby. I mean, that sounds like the end of pregnancy. That's like, what my therapist said. She was yeah. like, you're birthing a yeah. thing. And I was like, yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah. I love it, and I, I hope, hope the other kids are yeah. so nice. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you know, what you asked earlier about, you know, was there anything that readers have brought up that I was surprised yeah. by? I think, you know, by virtue of writing this book, I was surprised by how much my identity as an Egyptian American woman was actually so core to me. Mm -hmm. And this book was my way of, of like reforging that relationship with that part of, of myself. That's so great. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so talking about the reader, you know, maybe it's tangential to this. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, but like if a teenage girl picks this book up tomorrow, or tonight, let's say, um, and what would you hope that she would glean from, from these pages? Like what's your, as when you're writing it, when it's coming out of the world, what do you imagine? What do you hope for? So my answer to this question has evolved with mm. the weeks that have passed mm. since the publication of this book. I think I used to say, and it's still true, um, you know, you can do whatever you put your dreams to or whatever you yeah. dream of and don't let anybody tell you that you're not cut out for something. Yeah. Um, 
That's a good one. And that's true, that's right? Good. I think what's missing from that is this acknowledgement of these institutions and structures mm. that make it incredibly difficult to stay and to pursue your dreams. And I think it's important to acknowledge that yeah. and also say, I hope that you find the support and the community and the mentorship and the allyship to continue on, whatever that dream might be. And that these institutions and these systems, while powerful and enormous and intimidating, they are not um, insurmountable. Yeah. They are not totally all powerful. Right. They have fallen. I mean, you know, many, many, many an institution have fallen. Right. And I think the more people we have that, you know, are underrepresented in these fields, right, of course, like the institutions will start to change from the ground up, but we need people in power to make that happen. So that's a whole. That's a whole separate conversation. But I think more of what I'm evolving towards is less of a accomplishment specific mm. takeaway and more of a maybe what I wish someone had told me when I was a teenage girl, which isn't just you can do whatever you set your, your mind to, but it's also like you are loved and worthy mm. no matter what that is. Yeah. And like you can shoot for the moon and you can also like not. Yeah. And yeah. there is no intrinsic like worth set because of that. Yeah. That's really good. That's a really good message. Um, so like in your career as an astrophysicist, what has changed? What about the astronomical cosmic perspective has changed your experience? of life down here on the surface of this planet. Like, how does it impact you on a daily basis? Yeah, um, so I talk, I, I start all of my public talks with this image of the universe. It used to be from Hubble, and now it's the JWST deep field. Um, so for those who don't know, JWST is the James Webb Space Telescope. It was launched um, a year and a half ago, and the deep field came out almost exactly this time last year. And, and it's, it's jaw-dropping. It's startling. I mean, it's yes. an astonishing startling. image yeah. where you see in stark relief galaxies upon galaxies upon galaxies. There are thousands of galaxies in this one image, which if you hold your hand out, I wish I had the image because I'm like, it's so beautiful. Let me talk to you about it. We have no idea what it looks like. Um, if you were to hold your hand out, it would be the size of a piece of sand, a grain of sand in your hand at arm's length. And it's, it's a small sliver of the vastness of the universe. And there are not just thousands of galaxies, there are hundreds of billions of stars in those galaxies. And then you start to think about the number of planets and you, I mean, if your mind isn't blown, mine is. I mean, it's just like such a, for me, when we talk about perspective and we talk about meaning and we talk about context, that image is a reminder to me of just how small we are. It is a perfect illustration of not just how small we are, but how precious yes. Our world yes. is our relationships with um, one another. The conversations that we have about like things like this, right, that matter. I mean, yeah. as humans, I think it's one of our like. This is a broad generalization, but I do believe it to be true. You know, we've been drawn to the stars for centuries, from for forever. I mean, to me, that's the most traditional right. thing that we do. Exactly, and I and it's we've we've created that relationship with the night sky, I mean, you could speak to this far better than I can, you know, in, <laughs> in, in very, like, physical ways, right, like, when we, uh, like, when we farm, yeah. when we, like, create time, you know, our concept of time, yeah. and how we just sort of make meaning out of our lives, yeah. and truly construct our daily lives, yeah. and then from that, there's also these deeper questions, right? Like, where did we come from? Yeah. How did we get here? Are we alone? What is the fate of the yeah. universe? These enormous questions that to me are, you know, intrinsic to the human condition. It's yeah. like, we are talking yeah. about what it means to be here. And that is precious. That yeah. is why that image of our, you know, to quote your dad, like, yeah. you know, this like lone speck of yeah. dust yeah. in the universe hanging yeah. in a dust beam. Like, yeah. I paraphrase that terribly, but no, you get no, the point. No, <laughs> no, no. Um, totally, totally agree. And I mean, 
it, I, I, it's like I think sometimes we shy away from that stuff because of, to circle back, anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, like, and that feeling of like how, uh, it's so the existential crisis, like the feeling of like, we are so tiny, we- Nothing matters. Nothing matters, it's yeah. very easy to just have a full um, panic attack and just like, we, we sure. like, we're here for like a second and we die and the universe is gonna explode and nothing. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, this is taking time. Um, but like, you know, that idea, like it's very easy to just be like, la la la, we're gonna put it over there, like what we're talking about about anxiety. And I think if there's a parallel here to what you were saying about all the anxiety, mm -hmm. is like to be in relationship with the discomfort of those questions as well as the grandeur and the beauty of those questions yeah. is the way forward. Absolutely. I think that's a very honest, very honest answer. And I think that's so true. I think it's easy to cast something as like good or bad, yeah. big or small, like overwhelming or not overwhelming, when in reality it's all of it. Yeah. And, and like yeah. the exercise is to hold the vastness of it all and then move on, yeah. right? Like move forward yeah. holding that. Yeah. And I think to me, that makes my relationships richer, yes. not just with each other, but within myself. I talk oh. about this like at the very end of the book where I talk about, you know, I study the universe up there in tandem with investigating the universe within. Yeah. And I think in many ways, like we all have our versions of that. Yeah. And like that's holding both. Yeah. That's that's like holding the discomfort and the comfort yeah. and then and then trying to like make meaning out of it. Yeah. So of those questions that you mentioned, those big questions of are we alone and what's that gonna happen and what, like all those, like which is the one, like is there a question on that scale that you feel like we are on the cusp of a deeper understanding um, that you have a particular interest in, that you are hoping that in your career in science we will get maybe not a, a concrete answer to, but a little bit of a clue that our ancestors never could have hoped mm -hmm. for. Yeah, I think two of them. I think, you know, well, maybe I'm being a little bit brave on one of them, but <laughs> I think one that we are actually quite close to um, having a chance of solving or, you know, we're being tasked with answering, yes, the biggest questions of the universe, but some of them, are sort of there already, and that one is the fate of the universe. Mm. So that's a that's a good one. We yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, it's awful. How do we all end? Um, <laughs> I think you know that's what my research is tasked yeah. with um, is investigating the rate of the expansion of the universe. So for those who don't know, the universe is not static; it's expanding, and it's not just expanding; it's accelerating. It's getting faster and faster with time. Um, so what does that mean for the fate of the universe? You know, are galaxies just going to get further and further away from each other until we're plunged into darkness and, you know, we live in this, like, never-ending black hole of, of dark, right? Which sounds really bad. Oh, um, so bad. But is it bad? <laughs> is it bad? And I think, you know, the answer is, like, how, knowing that, how does that inform our ability to take the present moment and, and really appreciate how precious it is, yeah. how precious it is that yeah. we're all here and we are all getting to experience this moment in time. Yeah. And I think- In this you know, bookshop right now. Right? Right? Yeah, right all now. together in this communal yes. ritual. Yes. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, when we're, when we're talking about these big fundamental existential crises that face humankind, like climate change, and we're we're really trying to appreciate, yeah. you know, how the answer isn't, oh, we'll just move to another planet, right? right. Like, the answer is we live in an incredibly, extraordinarily precious place. And I think having the context for what's out there allows yeah. us to really make hopefully very informed, smart decisions to save yeah. where we where we are. Yeah. That, and that's, I mean, an answer to why this all matters. Yeah. You know, why, why does it matter when we talk about the fate of the universe? Well, it matters because it matters right now. Yeah, yeah. Wait, so what was the other the other question you feel oh. like we're gonna get an Yeah, answer, I was trying to like, I was like really brave when I said this. Okay. Um, you don't, you can- No, 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 I mean, <laughs> this is like a, you know, if I were to answer a question, I hope it's this, I mean, who knows? Someone very smart will get there one day. Okay. 
but it's you know how did the universe how did we get yeah. here right yeah. the, and the birth of the universe we yeah. have this theory the big bang theory yeah. and i think it is very widely accepted and there's a lot of evidence for it and i you know i think most astronomers and physicists agree with it but there are parts of it that i would like to understand yeah. right like yeah. parts like inflation so this period of rapid expansion yeah. right after um you know the big bang i think that's you know telescopes like the james Webb space telescope are getting closer to peering into those you know farthest reaches of the universe the earliest moments in time and i think that's why i said you know we might have a chance of getting to those answers it's so it's the bookends yeah that's so fascinating oh well keep me posted oh i will um, <laughs> <laughs> you'll be the first person i call yeah, believe me <laughs> so um and then I guess lastly, before we go to questions, does that seem right for time? Um, so you talked a little bit about your research and a little bit about your life, but talk about like what you're, you know, go in a little more detail about what you're doing next and now and what you'd like to be doing in a couple of years. Oh boy. I never know what to say <laughs> <laughs> this question. I think, you know, I am learning uh, through this book process, I have been so inordinately busy so busy and i've been uh juggling a bunch of wonderful fantastic things and i think i'm learning that and <laughs> if you get to the epilogue i talk about an epilogue yeah. that like rest is yeah. radical and yeah. that is i'm i'm not the first person to say that there are very very smart other people who've said that but i i am uh, maybe internalizing that a yeah. little bit more with each and yeah. every day and I think choosing how to devote my time it's hard when you love so many different things and you're so passionate about yeah. many different things um, I want to do all of them all the time when in reality I think I'm giving less of myself to each one mm. because I'm so divided and I would like to consolidate and then you know, go to the moon, right? Like <laughs> figuratively and literally. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, good. I think that's excellent. <laughs> well, this is just, I mean, we could talk for days. This is such a pleasure, but I'm sure everyone else has questions too. And thank you so much. Thank you. No, no, you. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> Curious, um, in your relationship to the universe over time from young age up, how has your spiritual sense of meaning and self grown or evolved through that process? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if everybody heard, but the question was essentially, you know, as I've gotten older and I've had this relationship with the universe from four years old till now, how has my spirituality evolved um, or changed? And I think. It, it's so interesting you ask this question because the first chapter of the book, I am at an Episcopal school and I am, you know, sitting in chapel. I went to chapel every single day. Um, and the minister brought up, you know, we are, you know, made from Adam and Eve and we came from, I don't know, I read the book. It's in there. <laughs> I'll read the Bible, actually. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> What I took away from that was this existential question of like, if that's where we came from, then where did God come from, right? And then where did that come from? And, you know, as a first grader, like reckoning with these like big scales. And that's not to say that, you know, I, I don't mean to like criti critique anybody's religion, but I think for me, that was my first deep question about uh, how did we all get here? And, um, I think I, you know, would certainly classify myself as spiritual, but not religious. I think I, my spirituality is like the universe. <laughs> it's like, we are stardust. We're going to go up and, and, you know, be stars one day and then we'll not be. And then that's sort of the evolution of the universe. And, um, I find a lot of meaning from that. You know, my dad has uh, terminal cancer and when I think about him passing one day I think about he'll be a star up there and how beautiful is that so yeah yes hi 
Um, I have a question uh, related to your uh, re relationship um, with your um, elders uh, in, in the lab. You know? So I just downloaded your audiobook and I'll deal with that later. No. <laughs> but I have to confess I am not very familiar. No worries. But scientists to scientists, this is something uh, very curious to me because for who, who doesn't know, science is a little bit of an MLM scheme. It's true. It's entirely true. What happens is that you go as a science communicator, as a nowadays social media, whatnot, when you're on the top of the pyramid mm. and you have a lot of people working with you, a lot of leverage to leverage the data, especially in experiments that are so large, such as the ones that you guys do in astronomy. You know? And so, I, how do you even, so I, I guess the university would be very glad for the exposure that's mediatic, but at the same time, uh, you, you are less of, uh, I mean, you are subtracting part of your time to that Ponzi scheme, to that base of the pyramid where you have to work like a slave because you're not yeah. mm -hmm. even, even graduated as a PhD. So like, I, I let's, you know, I don't know anything about your field or whatnot, but if you were a student of mine, I would think twice before hiring you as a postdoc or whatever. Sure. But like, is this person gonna? Yeah, like so what is my on, credibility you... because I'm doing this stuff on the side? Uh, right, and also maybe the time because you got need to sleep, right? Of you course. Discuss about that. Yeah. So how, how does it work? How do you make it work? Well, I think my first answer is science is not just what you do in the lab. Like, I think that there, when I write grant proposals, I write about my science outreach, and that is a fundamental part of my value as a scientist, and I think that's a fundamental part of every scientist's value, and I don't think that we uh, value that enough. So I am choosing to not buy into the Ponzi scheme of the yeah. MLM structure that academia, you know, relies upon. and you know, to be forthright, I'm not staying in academia. Um, this, you know, I'm getting my PhD and I'm out, and that's not because I don't think I can hack it as a scientist, it's because I think that that institution doesn't value all of the things that I have to offer, and so I'm going to take that elsewhere and make a big impact. Science communication as a thing in the United States is not so big. I feel like in the past couple of years, we've kind of started to get a little bit more ball rolling on like, I walk up to someone and I tell them I'm a science communicator and they're like, what's that? What do you do? Yeah. What has been your biggest challenge there and how, how are you combating that? I don't, you know, my first exposure to science communication was Carl Sagan. I mean, literally, I was in 11th grade and I was like, uh, my, my teacher, my astrophysics teacher had, I mean, not to be weird, but like literally a shrine to Carl Sagan. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he loved him. And I mean, part of the reason why is because, especially for, you know, 16, 17 year olds who don't know math or physics to the capacity that, you know, a graduate student or a faculty member might, that's a way to excite people and hook people and get people invested in science. Um, and then from there, I think I always imagined that that would be a dream career to be able to share, you know, the magic of, and I say magic, but it's not magic because it's physics, but you know, the magic of the universe with the world. In terms of hurdles, I think exactly what you just spoke to. I mean, I think there is this, um, I think oftentimes people who are later career scientists, um, frankly, revile people who break free of the sort of traditional way to carve a path for yourself in science. Um, but I, I just choose to not listen to them because I, I, I like, I don't, I don't think that's the only way to be a scientist. And I think that's part of what, you know, when we talk about diversity, like that's part of what we're talking about is there's not one way to look like a scientist or to be a scientist or to do science. Science isn't just about, you know, like publishing papers. And I think that the structure of science 
is, and I talk about this in the book, for me, science is about being curious. Everyone can be curious. It's about analytical thinking. It's about gathering evidence and then trying to find ways of making meaning from that evidence. And yes, it's like a very generous way to talk about science, but I think fundamentally that's what science is. And like, that's what I want to share with the world. And I think when we talk about, I, I, I guess I'm sort of like, broadly answering your question, but I think when we consider these, you know, huge pressing, uh, you know, things in, in facing humankind right now, we talk about climate change, we talk about vaccine uptake, when we talk about, you know, gun reform, we are talking about science, like we need people to talk about science in a way that other people can understand. And when, I guess when you sort of like sell your value as a science communicator, like sell is like a harsh term, but you know, you say that, like we need people who can talk about things in an analytical way, in a very data informed way that affect everyone. And I, I think that is such a uh, unique and wonderful skill and we need more of it. <laughs> I'm gonna have to ask you to answer some no, of these no. questions. <laughs> great, great, great questions, great answers. Um, all right, anyone else? Yes, hi. As an underrepresented person in academia, how do you balance sometimes like the exhaustion that can come from facing discrimination in the workplace versus your excitement for your research and the science that you're doing? Mm, yeah, how do I balance the exhaustion and the excitement? Mm. Um, I think it's another example of holding both. Like, I think some days I am so uh, angry and fed up and tired of being angry and fed up. Um, and those are the days that I really try to connect with my community or connect with myself or you know, lean on the systems of support that I have in place to um, like be held. And then that allows me to show up better when I feel that passion and like when I can let that fuel what I choose to do. But it's hard, I mean, I think when you're in a system, right, or when you're in an institution that is inherently built for other people, for people not like you and me, like those feelings are so, they're not just real, like they're evidence of you are existing in a place that is not built for you historically. And you're showing up as a constant act of rebellion. Like you are changing things by doing so, but I think not, maybe not at the expense of, of yourself, right? Questions. Yes. Um, switching gears a little bit, I know you mentioned that you had a preventative for a woman's health me, and I was wondering, as a fellow breastfeed, if you can talk Thanks for being bit. here. <laughs> uh, talk a little bit about how that experience and that decision to do that fits into these more like existential questions that you are also asking yourself. Great question. Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, and for those who don't know, the breasties is this wonderful group of um, you know, people who have been affected by hereditary cancers and gynecological cancers. Um, and some of, I met some of my best friends from this group, so it's really cool to know. Um, yeah, so I, um, for those who aren't familiar, um, my dad was diagnosed with cancer when I was 23. And uh, shortly after his diagnosis, he got genetic testing. He came back positive for something called the BRCA2 gene mutation. Um, this is a hereditary uh, gene mutation and I inherited it. So I have an 87% lifetime risk of breast cancer, 30% uh, lifetime risk of ovarian cancer as well as other cancers. <laughs> it's the fun gene. <laughs> um, and yeah, I chose to get a preventative double mastectomy when I was 26 to reduce my risk of breast cancer from 87% to less than 5%. And I think 
you know, it's, it's, I'm so glad you asked this question because I talk about this in the book of, you know, using science to inform my decision making and also using anxiety to inform my decision making. And I, you know, we talked about that a little bit here. Um, but I actually, I chose to write this book as I was recovering from my mastectomy. I was sitting there, you know, thinking about what it means to be in relationship with my body and what it means to be in relationship with myself and how my experience of advocating for myself to get a double mastectomy. When I had doctors dismiss me because I don't yet have cancer um, or I'm too, too young to be thinking about it, you know, what that self-advocacy uh, isn't unique to that experience, but is also unique, or is also, you know, what I did when I was carving out a place for myself in science. I think everybody who has to advocate for themselves in one way or another can resonate with that story. And I was so interested in investigating this question of like, what, how do you advocate for yourself? How do you um, push for what you feel is right? And I think that's another like common theme throughout the book is like, I, my intuition or my anxiety or, you know, science was telling me one thing and yet you know, different people or institutions or whatever, doctors were telling me another thing, how do I push forward? And I think that's, that's you know, one of the common themes from that experience. Um, I think another common theme is that, you know, people of color are historically, you know, have much worse, um, much higher rates of breast cancer, have uh, much more difficulty accessing care. And I mean, you talk about people of color in any space, they are more at risk. And that was a, so fundamentally like discomforting to me. And I wanted to talk about that. And I wanted to talk about how it's not, a spe it's not specific to healthcare and it's not specific to science. It's specific to existing as a person who doesn't look like everybody else. And like, what is that existence like? something that should be accessible for all. And then you add in, and I'm going out on the limb here, but then you add in, you know, satellites and all these other things and it becomes a disaster. So what can we do? There are uh, groups that advocate for dark skies. Um, I am part of one and, you know, there are small changes that cities can make, that you yourself can make to turn your lights in different ways or to turn off your lights at certain times and that makes it more accessible for everybody. So that's one of the things that's like a small act that you can do. You can also, of course, like talk to your city council and that's like a form of advocacy that I think would benefit everybody. Um, and then of course, like if you have the means and the access, like getting out of town, um, it's truly just like an hour. I mean, I don't know from Boston, but like where I live, you know, I live in Berkeley, which is 40-ish minutes from San Francisco, depending on the traffic. And the night sky is completely different in Berkeley than it is in San Francisco. It's just that that little bit of distance can make a huge change. In terms of my favorite constellation, um, I would say it's Orion. Uh, I studied the star Betelgeuse for a very long time. So it's the left shoulder of the constellation Orion and it's bright red, it's called a red supergiant, and it will explode one day, and it's super cool, you should learn more about it. Um, and you can see it with your naked eye. So I think that's something that is so 
wonderful because in astronomy, the time scales are so vast, right? We're talking about billions and billions of years for things to happen, but when supernova occur, it happens in a matter of days. It happens in a fraction of a second for the star to collapse. So um, if you look at Orion long enough, maybe it'll explode. <laughs> what a perfect last question. Thanks for being here.